we got a special guest uh, here tonight. Uh, we we got him queued up already. We were gonna wait to the, to the uh, later on, but I say we go ahead and do it now. We got him here. We don't want to waste his time. But uh, joining us right now is a very good friend of mine. Uh, you hear him every day from what's that? From about ten to two on one hundred five three. The fan. He's a uh, he's a Rangers former pitcher. He's Mike Bassick of the, and it's, uh, if I'm understanding right, it's the KMC Masterpiece. <laughs> the crowd goes wild. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, you there? I'm there. What's up, brother? What's going on, man? How's it going? It's going good. The Mavericks aren't losing tonight. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of funny because I didn't know they were playing, so I guess that makes it easy on them tonight. <laughs> Listen, man. You know why I had to have you. First off, we want to thank you for joining us on that uh, on that post game show we do. Uh, me and Billy do on uh, after games on uh, Maverick nights. That was fun. My wife wasn't happy with me though because she was asleep next to me, and at like midnight, she's like, "You need to go to bed." <laughs> well, we know. We, does she know? Does she know how passionate you are about these Mavericks? Does she know? Yes. Yes. Okay. She does. And I see. Are you are you back in the pantry right now? This is the pantry that I'm we in hear the about. The pantry all the time. where I do my work. Yeah. So uh, I leave everybody alone and can be as loud as I want to be. <laughs> there you go, <laughs> Mike. Uh, we got you here, man. Just what is your overall beef with the Mavericks right now? What 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 do we got? Well, my overall beef is with me personally because I thought they would be better. And uh, getting to talk to like a guy like former NBA player Brian Scalabrini, he said, well, what were your expectations? And I said, I thought they could maybe be a three or four seed and get home field uh, or home court advantage in the first round. And he said, nah, they're more like a six through eight seed. So your expectations were just too high. And he's like, I still think they're going to be a six through eight seed. So part of it is me, I guess, Walt, is that I thought they were going to be better. They looked great in the preseason. I know it's just preseason, and I need to stop watching preseason basketball. Never stop watching preseason basketball. Never. <laughs> because I keep thinking these things are going to happen because something looks good, and it isn't. But I will say this. There's plenty of time for them to get better. Mm -hmm. But what I'm concerned about and worried about right now is out of 18 games this year, they didn't show up for six games. You can lose games. That'll happen in a, in a season. But – and you'll probably have in, in your first 20 games, you'll have two games where you just don't show up. The schedule, you're just too tired because the schedule or just for then you're just not as a team into it. A third of your games, you haven't been into it. You haven't had the energy to give it your all. That's concerning to me. And I just read today that Porzingis said their chemistry is off. What? In kind of a general statement and guys haven't been there. So I'm just wondering when is the chemistry going to happen? Is it never going to happen? So those are my concerns, Walt. Well, I'll tell you what. Did, well, he says the chemistry is off. Uh, duh. Uh, we we didn't. I don't think we noticed that, right? Yeah, no. I we, didn't we, we didn't notice that. I didn't notice at all. And uh, what we you pointed that out on the show today, actually. Uh, what I was talking about last night about how uh, we don't feel uh, him and Luca are uh, <laughs> as close as everybody like want to believe that they are. Yeah, and I don't know their personal relationship, and I really don't care about their personal relationship. What I care about is Magic Worthy, I mean, you know, Magic Kareem, jo Stockton Malone, even like I know Jordan Pippen weren't just passing the ball to each other, and they played in the system, and Kobe and Shaq obviously hated each other uh, at the end of it. They, they couldn't stand each other. But there was chemistry there when they were both on the court at the same time. They both got, both got the most out of their game. Right. Shaq was never better in his career than when Kobe was on the court with him. Right. Kobe, you could, and, and he matured too, but like Kobe's, his, sometimes his best games ever were with Shaq on the court because they had to pay attention to Shaq. So he got his one on one matchup and stuff like that. When Luca and Porzingis are on the court, they've had their moments in their short career, but it should be easier than this. Very. Real chemistry, real, that real natural. We're together and we make each other the best we are. It doesn't really happen on a consistent basis. So to me, this isn't natural. This is not a perfect combination. Uh, and we're talking to Mike Bassig, uh, host, one of the hosts of the KMC Masterpiece. As I want to make sure I get that right. <laughs> make sure you get that right. Go ahead. Hey, Mike, I got a question for you here. So uh, what do you think about the overall addition of uh, Josh Richardson, uh, and, and getting Dorian Finney-Smith and those guys back from the COVID protocol, uh, do you 
do you think that they are kind of fulfilling those roles that they brought them here for, which is, uh, you know, being kind of three and D guys? I mean, I know Finney Smith has been with us a few years, but do you feel like Josh Richardson has been a valuable piece to this team so far? Not yet. Okay. Now, he only got to play eight games and then COVID hit him. I really like him for this team because he's a two-way player. Right. He can give you – I thought it would be better, and it's early, but I thought he'd be more like 15 to 18 points the way he was in Miami. If you look at his numbers, right. he was pretty much 15 to 16 and a half per season. And I thought he would get there with Luca, you know, giving him really nice looks. That hasn't happened yet. And then I know he's the best defensive player on the Dallas Mavericks. He makes life hard – on the best players. Can right. you ever stop Damian Lillard no. or whoever you want? You're never going to stop him, ever. You know, Devin Booker, I know it was the start of the year, but he made Devin Booker finally against the Mavericks look like he wasn't Jordan and, and Kobe combined. Right. Like, I, I mean, mean finally Booker somebody crushed. right on yeah. the Mavericks made him look like that. He would crush us. And so you watched a guy who made the game difficult on the best scoring option, perimeter scoring option, and I think he brings that to the table. I believe his shot will start to fall at some point this year and people will get off my back because I really did like the trade. I know there's a lot of Seth Curry fans out there. Right. And I get right. it. But they, they're they they're really mad right now at that trade. And I think at the end of the year that they're going to say, okay, I get the trade because defensively he gives us a chance late in the game to stop somebody exactly. from getting an easy bucket. Okay. Uh, Mike, as I told you um... – you know, of course, I was down at the AAC a lot last season. And, you know, there were times I would talk to Steph Curry. He would, he would say, you know, I, w I was hot last night. I just don't understand what, you know, what was going on this night where I didn't get I didn't get back on the floor. What's going on? I didn't get as many looks um, this night. But um, you brought up – we brought up a topic. Uh, I brought up a topic through you last night through text last night that I want to touch on with you now because I've seen it. Um, brought up again. I think his name was Terry Rhodes on uh, – on a uh, Twitter, he was having a conversation and he said something that me and you that mimicked us where we said, maybe it's time to take Luca off the ball. I have mentioned this before. And of course the MFFLs and people who cover the Mavericks thought I was crazy and it was a ridiculous idea, but I tried to explain to them in 2001, Larry Brown took Allen Iverson off the ball and it was the best decision for Allen Iverson. He became an MVP and he took the freaking set. He took that 76ers team to, to the NBA Finals, and they won a game over the uh, L.A. Lakers. Why can't that be Luka? What is wrong? Why I don't get why people think he has to have the ball to thrive. And if you got a player who has to have the ball to thrive, then we are in trouble. Yep. Well, I'll say this. We need better talent for that to happen. Um, now, that being said, you know, Iverson didn't have the best talent. I thought Larry Brown did a great job of putting the perfect pieces around. I get that people don't think Theo Ratliff is that great of a player. Eric Snow is that great of a player. Hey, 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 don't forget about my guy Aaron McKee. <laughs> right. And in the context of an NBA ranking your players one through 500, they're not going to be ranked in the top 200. Right. But they were perfect fits with Allen Iverson, and they were perfect fits for Larry Brown's system. Right. And so when I look at Luka – I do think the Mavericks could be making a mistake. It's going to play out here. We'll find out. I do think they're making a mistake going, we want nobody to be able to dribble and create. We want four guys that are able to. It seems like they want four guys that are playing defense and shooters, but no dribblers, no creators on their own because they don't want Luka off the ball. Well, I know Kobe before he passed, and it was close to right before he died. He talked about this in James Harden, and he said that type of basketball will never ultimately win in the playoffs. You can't just give the ball to a guy 100% of the time and him have the energy to beat a team four out of seven times and for the team to stay engaged in the series because at some point that guy's going to get cold. He needs help. How many times have we seen Harden struggle in the playoffs? Yep. And his teammates are like, why the hell are you giving me the ball now? We played 82 games. I watched you do all this. Like – now, now I need to create and I need to do things. And, and so the Mavericks need to figure out a better way. Bill Jackson, when he came in, like Doug Collins, at one of the great shots that Jordan hit, he said, what was the play? Give it to Jordan and get the F out of the way. Ultimately, that wasn't going to win a championship. It was like, you got to be a team. And then the last five minutes for, for Jordan, for Kobe, take it over. We're, we're, 
We're scratching the, the, the triangle and giving it to you. But for 40 something minutes, we have to play as a team. And right. so I do worry right now that the Mavericks are relying on one person so much. Yeah. That being said, they did a poor job in the off season trying to even get somebody who could help him with that. And maybe that will be this off season or this trade deadline going, Hey, somebody else has to be a ball handler on the court. Do you think, do you think to me, it feels like they still had this mindset that they can win championships with role players like they did in 2011. Is that, is that still the thinking that what, what you feel too? Well, yes and no. When we go back and now look at that, Jason Kidd obviously is one of the greatest point guards of all time. And I know he wasn't in his prime, but he's there. Jason Terry's a lottery pick. Tyson Chandler's a second overall pick or fourth overall pick, I know, by the Bulls. Like, he's a top five pick. Sean Marion, the ninth overall pick. Karan Butler, I know he got hurt midway through the season. That's a top ten pick. A lot of the people on the court with, with, uh, with Dirk, they were – top 10 draft picks they had a lot of talent and they were veterans who were about 30 years old who knew their role in the nba they've right. been in the league for eight to ten years and knew exactly what made them successful as a player in the nba and what they could to the table to help win an nba basketball game and i think billy you brought up a guy like dorian finney smith I love him because of how hard he works. Right. You remember his first two years in the league, it's like he can't make a basket to save his life. Like right. literally, you could find guys at Kimball Carter and Duncanville that could shoot the ball better than <laughs> Shots fired at Tovash. <laughs> but he worked his butt off to become an okay three-point shooter. Does Dorian Finney-Smith at this point in his career, and we can go around the table to a whole bunch of guys on this team, even Jalen Brunson, who I like as a really good backup point guard, do they know, and he's a championship basketball player in college, do they know their role in the NBA on how to help win games mm -hmm. and win playoff games? Yep. I don't think they're to that point in their career, and we're seeing the struggle of that. And who's the veteran guy to really help these guys through this situation? I agree with you, Mike. Let me ask you a question here. So let's just say the Mavericks get to the trade deadline. We're all looking for a move. If there's one guy that will be available uh, that we could try to get, who are we aiming for? Who helps this team? Well, I think the aim, but who I are you trading the white power for? Stop that. Stop that. <laughs> who you Wait, who do you say? Who are you trading the white power for? That guy. <laughs> Well, for, for a better player. <laughs> uh, the the perfect fit, I think, would be Bradley Beal because you talk about a guy who can light it up. Who Look, Luke is a bad three-point shooter, yeah. at least inconsistent. You can either use either words, you know, because at times it looks nice and, and you're like, how did he make that? And then he takes a wide open one and he barely hits rim. Right. But you could give the ball to Bradley Beal in the last three minutes and he could win the game for you by scoring the buckets and take a little bit of pressure off of Luka there. And he's a better scorer of the basketball. And nothing against Luka. He's unbelievable at it. But Bradley Beal's even better. Unfortunately, there's almost no way to get him. Mm. So I, I hate that Levine has gone to this season and has played so great because I really liked him in the offseason. And he was kind of available. But at this point, it looks like Chicago's like, no, 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 no. We got a guy who's going to average 35 and 5. And so we're probably not going to move him. But there has to be somebody else. And this is not a, a hate on Porzingis. But what I'm concerned about, when we watch Porzingis play with the Mavericks, because you're asking me who to trade for, and this is my concern. Have you guys, do you guys remember the games that Porzingis in the last three minutes scored like 10 points and won the game because offensively he was unstoppable in the last three minutes, the clutch time in the NBA? Yes, last season I watched all those and, and I and I said this because um, the players they had last year, I think they had better floor spacing yeah. for him as opposed to this year. Now you got Tim Hardaway blasting threes and moving around. Last year it was like Steph Curry knew where he was going to be at. Uh, Dodo, you knew he was going to go run to the corner over there. And uh, KP had this whole area right here to work with. Now he looks around, he gets the ball. James Johnson has come running this way, or Collie Stein's come running this way, or Tim Hardaway is coming darting over here. He, I just think, like you said, Rick's got to get, uh, I think you posted this, Rick's got to get better at finding spots to get Porzingis the ball at on the court. Yeah, That is 100% true. And especially the last three minutes, because... 
he doesn't, to me, this is my opinion, he doesn't impact the offensive in the last two to three minutes of games, and that's why the Mavericks gave up leads last year, not only defensively, yep. but it was like, dude, Porzingis, make a bucket for us. Like, demand the ball. Like, I know he's not Dirk and will never be Dirk. How many times did Dirk just say, give me the ball now, Get we're scoring two points. Right. But you know, got- and, and Porzingis doesn't have that in him, and maybe he never will, but he's got to get more aggressive and make some big shots for this team in the last two minutes. Isn't that supposed to be Luka's job, though, to take the ball and, and take it over? Yes. It's supposed to but be. Let me, let me, I'm going to, I'm, Walt, I'm going to give you something here that you're going to love. Okay. Maybe to take him off the ball the last three minutes and post him up. Yeah. Because. He has a six foot four to six foot six guy on him, and he's one of the strongest players in the NBA. He's not the most athletic, but he is one of the strongest. He bullies guys to the basket all day long. What if you took the ball out of his hands and just posted him up 10 feet from the basket? Now he's already 10 feet in, and they can't switch right, on right. picking stuff. They can try to keep switching and get the guy on him they want, and then he takes, you know, a step back three, and what's that, a 20% shot for yeah. him? So. Maybe late in the game, the 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 deal is post him up, you know, 10, 15 feet on the wing and let him go to work from there instead of maybe making him break down the D on the dribble on his own. And he actually is already starting to put a post-up uh, shot in his game as I watch him sometimes on the floor. But, Mike, this is what I was begging for last season. And people told me I was crazy and ridiculous for thinking that. Now I'm like, he is going to have to be more – uh, he is great. I mean, I'm sorry. He's good. He's not great yet, but he's going to have to be better for this team to go. He's going, and that's where Rick's Rick's comment. Everybody thought that was about his weight. Where Rick said, uh, be, "Was it being great is a is a year around mm-hmm. is a year around deal?" And I remember, I texted you at the beginning of the season. I said, "Man, it don't even like Luca picked up the ball at all while he was gone." Because he come back, he looked he looked to me like the exact same player. Yeah, I'm 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 somewhat with you there. And maybe this is going to be a really learning experience for him. We have to remember he still is 21. And I remember Candace Parker talking the other night and, and Reggie on our show brought this up and I was watching it too. And she said, the thing that you guys don't see with LeBron James is Sunday at 10 a.m. on a day that they're not playing, he's going to the gym and he's getting in his stretching and he's getting in his workout and he's doing all these things that nobody sees. That's why it, I think he's 36 or 37. That's why at this age, He's still arguably the best player in the game. He's one of the greatest ever. And it's not like he just shows up. And I'm not saying Luka doesn't just show up. But to your point, did he, when that season ended, the way we saw in the Jordan documentary, tell his trainer, I'll see you tomorrow? Yeah. No. Luca didn't. Luca ain't like Luca right now is saying, "I'll see the beer, and I'll see whatever." But I ain't seeing uh, a trainer, and I'm not working out the day after we lost out of the bubble. I need vacation, and so you know what? If this season goes the way it keeps going, Walt, and they get ousted in the first round, or maybe you know play in the play-in game and don't win, maybe that's a huge wake-up call to Luca that this is not going to be easy. Okay, uh, Billy brought up something last night that I definitely want to touch on before I let you go. Billy said last night it looks like they kind of quit. Yeah. Do you feel like, are you seeing quit out of the players on the court? Because if that's the case, you know what that means for the head coach, right? It could be. Um, I think, Billy, you bring up a great point here. Here's my concern, and it goes with the quit. And I don't want to use that strong of a word, but whenever, I know it's baseball and it's not basketball, but it's the same thing. Whenever you get your ass chewed out by your coaching staff or by your leaders, the next game, it doesn't mean you're going to win, but damn it. We're going to run the bases harder. We're going, when we hit a ground ball to third base, your ass is running down to first as hard as you can because this coasting isn't working. Right. So we have to pick it up. So they have a meeting where it sounds like Carlisle, Luca and James Johnson were the leaders of the meeting. And they said the effort and the energy has to pick up and then you go to utah and you fly on a plane and play the next day and immediately there's no effort and there's no energy you're getting out rebounded they're in transition you're not getting back on defense you seem a little bit lost at times on offense and i'm thinking whoa if you just had a meeting on focus energy and effort and that was what you brought 24 hours after that meeting that's a bad sign I hope it changes, but that's a very bad sign for a team 
when after a meeting about your energy and effort, you show up and show no energy and effort from the tip. Well, okay, I want to run this down to you too. I ran, I ran this by Billy last night. This is why I feel like the Mavericks are in trouble right here. I want to run this schedule down to you, okay? Uh, two games in Philly here, right? That's uh, after the Jazz on Friday. Saturday, they turn around and they play. I'm sorry, Sunday they play the they play the Suns. Sunday and Monday, right? They fly to Atlanta uh, on the third. They come back to Dallas. That's they, a 30 rebound game for Clint Capella. <laughs> <laughs> He's right. It's a good point by you, Mike. They come back on the fourth and the sixth, right? That's a Thursday and I'm guessing a Saturday, and play Golden State twice. Okay. They they get a they get a Timberwolves game. I'm guessing somebody's resting that game, right? Mm. So they got they play the third, the fourth, and the sixth in one in one week. That's a uh uh I want to say a Wednesday a Thursday, and then a Saturday. And these two, the uh, the Warriors game, TNT, ABC, which means nobody can sit out. Nobody can rest those games with the way the NBA has constructed it uh, now. Okay, so they come back in Timberwolves. They go, they play the Hawks again. The Hawks come here. They play the Pelicans on the 12th, Trailblazers on the 14th, the Pistons on the 17th, the Rockets on the 19th, Grizzlies uh, 22nd, 23rd Celtics, 25th uh, 76ers. And then the season pauses because they haven't made the second second half of the season yet. Jesus Christ. Hey, this is where, like, Gavin Dawson, who's cool, calm, and collect, right? (laughs) I wonder what the Maverick fans that are like, it's fine, it's no big deal. If they are, let's say in three weeks, 12 and 18. How are we going to feel when then you look at the 10th seed? And I know there's a lot of teams that are struggling. Like Phoenix is 8-8. Eight and eight. I, I like their team, but they're I'm not watching them. They play tonight, by the way. I'm probably going to pick them up a little bit tonight and look at them. But I, I, it's, it's interesting that teams aren't separating except for right now Utah and the L.A.s. But at the same time, you find yourself 12-18, and 18, 30 games in with 40 to go approximately – you got to catch up all season long. Mm-hmm. So these nights that they are showing up and not showing up, yeah, you can sometimes later in the season you're like, ah, you know what? We're at the four seed and we're two games up and we're you know two games back, but we're eight games up on the eight seed. Like sometimes that happens. You know, you're just you're tired when you do a twelve and eighteen start after thirty or or you know around there, which I think the Mavericks are going to be. You can't take another night off. Yep. You can't rest poor Zingas' knee. Yep. You know what? I say, sorry, I'm paying you $30 million. Get your ass out there and play basketball, you know, because we can't lose anymore. We can't take a night off anymore because we've put ourselves in this bat of a hole. And coronavirus had something to do with it. It's not all the maths. That's part of the puzzle. But I would say this, in that second half of the season, if, if Luca were to get hurt, because I love him, if Luca were to get hurt, roll his ankle, and he's out for two to three weeks, there's a chance they don't even make the 10 seed. Well, Mike, here's the thing. This is why me, you, Kavanaugh, and Dawson that one year screamed, get in the draft and take it serious. Because we were getting ready to because we started with Dennis Smith, and then they got Luca. And once they got Luca, I felt like they thought, oh, well, we don't need to get back in the draft. We're good now. And yeah. it's coming back to bite them already. Yeah, well, what's crazy is even during the Luka trade, which I was amazed by, because Wesley Matthews, bless his heart, he tries hard, but once he tore his Achilles, he just can't move in the NBA the way you need to move to be really successful. They could have traded Wesley Matthews in that trade, got Bazemore, and kept the pick. You know, now, Cam Reddish, I didn't like Cam Reddish. That ended up being the pick. But they decided to give away that pick just so they could keep a little bit of extra cap space or you know like because wesley matthews contract was one year away and it was two years for uh baysmore and so to your point all of a sudden they're like oh we don't care about the draft don't worry that draft's not going to be any good right you know and then this year i think josh green's a decent prospect don't get me wrong i think he's a decent prospect and can end up being a valuable piece as a role player in the nba but I do think, and I'm biased here because of local products, 
I think Tyrese Maxey, before the draft, has a chance to be an all-star in the NBA. I think R.J. Hampton, talking to my guys that coach high school basketball, they think, look, in the right situation, confidence and everything like that, he could be a really great player in the NBA, a guy that can get you 20 points and five assists a night when he hits his prime. And the Mavericks just didn't want to do anything of that type of risk. They, they went with, to me, the most basic, secure player. He has a good body in Josh Green. Hopefully he can figure out how to shoot the basketball because he kind of did in Arizona, but right now it's ugly. And he has a high energy, high motor type of guy, but there were better prospects at 18. And hell, I think that precious guy for Miami would have helped us out a lot with yes. rebounding. Now but They just, they wanted a guy who could shoot a basketball right. and play defense. They wanted and three. I think that they passed up on some really valuable players. Okay, so... The thing that I tell Billy about is uh, games like Chicago, the game when Luka was out, and I scream this all the time. You'll see me post on Twitter. Put the rookies in. Let's see what they can do. What's the point? We're already down. Let's see what they can if they can rally something together and put something together and come. I just want to see them on the court. And yeah. uh, uh, before the season started, when you know they have Mass Media Day or whatever, I had my hand up in the in the uh, deal. I didn't get called on in the deal, but um, I was going to ask Rick. You know. Is this the youngest team you've ever had to coach? Because you've known for you known for having uh, older rosters. Is this the youngest team you ever had? And how do you plan on using this roster with it being young? You've never had to do this before. Now it's a great question, and I think for these guys, I do think for rookies this year, I do think it's the toughest that any rookie of any team has ever had to deal with with getting your college season cut short. You weren't able to truly prepare for a draft. You weren't drafted early where you could be in a summer league where you could be learning a little bit of the system, a little bit of the nuances of your coaches. And you just said, you're drafted in four weeks from now, we're playing an NBA basketball game. So I do think for all these rookies, this is a very tough season to try to impact your team this early. Uh, I think Wiseman's doing the best job, but man, I mean, watch tonight. Draymond Green is on his ass all yeah, game. Yeah, and I know yeah. he's a talker, but I mean, he's trying to put him in situations. You can see Wiseman's head's kind of spinning on the court, but Draymond's trying to get him in the right positions to be a successful player in his rookie year. That being said, I wish there was a G League for Green and Bay and Terry. And I guess Hinton too. I know we didn't draft him. Uh, and I think that the Mavericks aren't sending their guys to that bubble for G League play. I'm not 100% sure about that, but I don't think they are because if Tyrell Terry is just going to sit the bench, I'm intrigued by him. He kind of reminds too. me. Me too. Me too. Yes. I yeah. bet he can shoot to me. I want to see him. He has the Trey Young game. I'm not saying he's going to be Trey Young, but he has a very Trey Young game in him. And if he's just going to watch basketball games, I don't know how much better he's going to get. So if that's the case, then you got to get him in another league. I mean, I want to talk about a topic at some point on like uh, KNC Masterpiece about I wish the NBA would do something in like you can draft whoever you want to draft, but you have the option to be like, hey, Josh Green, you're not going to play on our team this year. Stay at Arizona. We're going to pay you your salary. You're going to get $3 million, but you're going to stay at Arizona and play because we think that's better for your development mm -hmm. than being here. And so I know that that would be tough because that would be paying college players. But do you have the property? I mean, people don't know this. Larry Bird was a Boston Celtic at Indiana State. When he was playing Magic Johnson in 79, in the he had already been drafted. Mm. That He wasn't like then he got drafted. He was already their property, so this has happened before. Now, he wasn't getting paid by the Celtics. He had already been drafted, and he was had the, the Celtics had his rights. Right. But I, I think, like, for a lot of these guys that are coming out early, and I get it. I mean, they want to be in the NBA. It's their dream. They want to get paid for the first time in their life to play basketball, at least legally get paid. And so when I look at this, I'm just like, could the NBA do something where these guys get to develop a little bit more – and play against competition where they can thrive while still playing college basketball. Who wins the Super Bowl, Mike? Woof. <laughs> I would say the Chiefs if Fisher didn't get hurt. I'm still going to stick with the Chiefs, but it scares me because, you know, Barrett and the Tampa Bay Bucks they can get pressure and make the game uncomfortable on quarterbacks. And Patrick Mahomes is the best. 
But if you make them uncomfortable and Tyree Kill can't get down the field 40 yards, that makes the game a little bit more difficult. I'm sticking with the Chiefs. I love Patrick Mahomes to death. But well documented. <laughs> I could see, I could see the the Bucks winning the Super Bowl. And he, oh, you, are you saying that because you think Brady's got the referees in his back pocket like he does every other time? <laughs> Somehow, some way, hey, I, you can do luck or whatever. The Mike. man pretty much just wins. I know he's lost three of these, but somehow, some way, something six. happens, and 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 so I don't. I usually, you know, I bet on the show. I don't know how much I'm going to bet on this because I am scared of that Tom Brady magic of something happening, and and, and uh, you know him winning another one. You know, in which I have fun with because so many people hate him and I respect the heck out of him. Yeah, I know. Some of that was going on in here in the studio the other night. Not going to name any names, but that's fine. But I want to tell you something before you go, man. You know, when you were traded to K, uh, KMC Masterpiece, I was like, I don't know how I feel about this. I like it. But let me tell you something, man. You coming on that show was the best thing that ever happened. I love the three of y'all. You got your guy, Corey Majors, is still the measuring stick for me. That is one talented SLB. Uh, I keep trying to find a way to top the no shirt nine o'clock here on this show. And I promise you before it's over, I will top the no shirt nine o'clock. Okay. That sounds good, man. Hey, thanks for all those compliments. I feel like the Mavericks have the no rebound nine o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. <laughs> That's some good stuff. Hey, Mike, I'm going to be listening to you tomorrow, man. You have a great night. All right. Thanks guys. That was fun. All right. Thanks a lot, Mike. <laughs> the no rebound nine o'clock. Yeah. That's new. We're it's starting also, in there. It's also so, no so, rebound. Seven o'clock. No eight o'clock. Eight o'clock nine. Uh, yeah. So uh, next time when they go on a no rebound streak, I'm gonna be like tweet out hashtag yeah. no rebound o'clock right yeah, now. That's what's going on. Credit to Mike for that. Uh man, what a great interview. I enjoyed it, man. Yeah, and I hate to bring the room down now because now you know we got to talk about something that that's really been controversial. I've been getting messages all day about what you did. <laughs> hey, <man. laughs> I just want to throw this out here. Man. You got to be ashamed of yourself. I, you really I'm need not, to be ashamed. I'm of not. I, I stand by everything that I say. And, and it's going to make sense. I'm going to break this down in such a way that it will make perfect sense oh. to Cowboys Nation. They will understand. They will. Un what, what was the what was the hashtag? We're restoring the Cowboys. RTC. 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 We're getting a hashtag going on Twitter. RTC. We will restore Are the Cowboys. Are you getting shirts made for this? I feel like there needs to be a shirt made. There's a possibility. I gotta, I'm, I'm going to keep that low key right now. There, it, it might be something that you 